Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar on this beautiful spring day here in Colorado. Happy to um, continue this lecture series on lean in algebraic number theory and arithmetic geometry. And today we're very happy to have Michael Stoll, who's going to be speaking on how to translate a proof into lean. And uh, Michael, is it all right for us to record this talk? That's OK, yeah. Wonderful. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them. OK, please go ahead. Yeah, so welcome, everybody. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, I thought it would be perhaps nice to see how we actually can do a proof in Lean um, in a reasonably simple example. And um, so the starting point is this math overflow question for two years, from two years ago. So it asks <clears throat> whether a certain um, differential equation is solvable in integers. And I mean, it's an interesting question because if, if you look at it, <clears throat> it's a conic bundle surface and it has a double cover, which is rational. So there are lots of rational points on this. Um, but the question regarding integer points is a bit more subtle. And um, yeah, so back then I, um, for an argument that shows that there's no solution, which basically uses quadratic reciprocity. So, <clears throat> I mean, here's, here's an overview. And um, so, yeah, the idea <clears throat> that I had was to try to show how to translate this proof into lean. But it turns out that this is too much for one hour. So we will focus on um, one part of it. But maybe just to explain this a little bit. Um, so it's... <clears throat> starts with the observation. Um, so, I mean, the equation is not here, but it's x, y times x plus y is seven z squared plus one. That uh, x and y cannot both be negative because then the left-hand side will be negative, but the right-hand side is clearly positive. And uh, if they're integers, they cannot be divisible by seven because um, on the left you have x times y times something, and on the right you have seven times something plus one. And then, yeah, we break the symmetry and assume that X is positive, call it A, and <clears throat> then one can sort of rearrange the equation introducing new variables, capital X and capital Y, to bring it in this form. And um, then this is a form where you can work with, <clears throat> say, Jacobi symbols to say something. Um, that basically says that this thing on the right, A times four plus A cubed, is a norm from the extension q root squared of q squared of seven times a. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, one has to distinguish cases according to whether a is odd or even. And in the odd case, um, these factors are both odd on the right hand side. And so we can look at this Jacobi symbol where you take seven a upstairs and four plus a cube downstairs, and then you use quadratic reciprocity. So um, depending on what a is mod four, one of these two numbers is congruent to one, and the other one is congruent to three mod four. So that's always one that's congruent to one. So you can just turn it around and then um, split it into the product. Where the second, so this symbol is always one because four plus a cubed is the square mod a, just four mod a. And um, so you end up with this symbol. And then there's a kind of miracle here because if a is an integer that's not divisible by seven, then um, four plus a cubed has only two possibilities, not seven is three or five, and both are non-squares. And so the symbol is minus one. Um, and then, so the, then comes the part of the argument that we will try to formalize. Um, so it's this part here, basically, so by the definition of the Jacobi symbol, um, as a product of the genre symbols, this means that there must be some, um, so I mean, looking at the left symbol here, there must be some prime divisor of four plus a cubed, an odd prime divisor because this is odd. Um, it has an odd exponent in the prime factorization with the property that seven a is a non-square mod p. And then um, one can use this to, to get a contradiction with this 
equation here um, because so we have P to an odd order here. P does not divide A because these two are co-prime, but if 7A is not a square mod P, then P must divide the left-hand side to, to an even power. And so this gives a contradiction. And then you can do something similar when A is even, um, which I maybe will not go into detail now here. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions later, then just interrupt and ask. So now, yeah, we want to, to formalize this part of the proof. And so I've prepared this here. So this is um, this Lean Life Lang.org website where you can just play with Lean. Um, so the first line says import method. So I'm importing the whole mathematical library of, of Lean, which is of course way more than we actually need, but um, there's basically no penalty doing that. So we can just do it. And then I set up a namespace just to avoid name conflicts. Um, and yeah, then the next thing I do here is I want to use, so the, the Jacobi symbol is defined in Mathlib and there's also notation introduced, which is this one. So capital J and then brackets A vertical bar B for the symbol that says A upstairs and B downstairs. And to access this notation, I have to, to do this open number theory symbols line. And I also open the, the int namespace, which allows me to shorten some of the names, but that's not so important. Okay, now the part of the proof that we want to formalize is basically this. So we, we have this equation. Um, and then there were some arguments that showed that this symbol here is minus one. And then it said, I mean, we have a prime divisor, odd prime divisor of four plus a cubed, which has odd exponent such that seven a is a quadratic non-residue. And then this gives us a contradiction. So, I mean, these, these are just three lines and of course <clears throat> they are not very detailed. So the formalized proof will be quite a bit longer. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a generally good idea to, so if you need some kind of auxiliary statement to formalize, um, these statements um, in a mm, generated, level of generality that may be useful in other contexts. So, and also usually if um, things are not too specific, it's easier to do the formal proof. So here we will sort of abstract from the specific form of these two or three terms that show up here. So we have the seven times A, which we just replaced by <clears throat> by variable d and then we have a times some other factor and we, we just call the other factor b and then if you remember one part of the argument said so we have this odd prime divisor of four plus a cubed that has an odd power in the prime factorization which implies that p does not divide a um and so what we use here is that four plus a cubed and, and a are co-prime. Yeah? So remember that a was odd in, in this part of the proof. So I mean, GCD divides four and if these numbers are odd, then it has to be one. So basically the, the statement we then get is the following. We have this equality, which now is of this more simple form. So x squared minus d times y squared equals a times b. Um, we assume that A and B are co-prime, that's this part here. And well, A, B, D, X, and Y are morally integers, but well, we also have the, the assumption that the Jacobi symbol, so which is the Jacobi symbol of D and B now with our conventions here is, is minus one. And um, because the Jacobi symbol method is defined in such a way that the first argument is an integer and the second argument is a natural number, um, it's more convenient to take B as a natural number here, but the other four variables can be integers. Um, so there are these, these two kinds of brackets, which if you have played with them, you will have seen, but maybe I say something about this. So there are basically two kinds of arguments that we have here. Um, the one in round brackets are arguments that you have to provide when you use the this lemma. So you say help, and then you have to provide so the proof 
of the co-primality of A and B, the proof of this equality, and the proof that the Jacobi symbol is minus one. But you don't have to explicitly specify the arguments that are in curly braces here. And um, this is because they can be deduced from the other ones. Yeah. So if, if I have a proof of this statement, then I know what A and B are. And similarly, from this, I can extract what X and D and Y are. And <clears throat> so I don't have to specify them explicitly. OK, so yeah, I mean, what does it say? We have these, these numbers, and then we have these three properties. And um, we want a contradiction, so false is a statement that's never true. So um, these three things lead to a contradiction. OK, then um, we start the proof by this keyword by. Um, and oops, so <clears throat> then we have this so-called goal state on the right. That tells us where we at are the proof at the, in the proof. So we have this special number B and these integers A, D, X, and Y, and then we have these three assumptions. And the last line with this strange symbol here tells us tells us what the goal is. So we, we want to prove false. Um, yeah, now the question is how, how do we start? So in the informal argument, um, it says that we have this odd prime divisor. There's an odd exponent in the factorization of, which is now called D, such that <clears throat> 7a, which is now D, is a quadratic non-residue mod P. And um, so we would like to find something like this in the library. And so one way to do this is to go to the documentation page um, of the whole lean and MathWeb ecosystem. And um, maybe start by searching for things related to Jacobi symbols. So type some text in this window here, and then um, you get some possible hits. And so the first one is just Jacobi sim. So that's the definition of the Jacobi symbol. I mean, if you are curious, you can look at what the definition is. Yeah, so um, it's a product over a list, and um, there are these genre symbols. Um, so I mean, that's the symbol that has A on top and P below. And so that's the usual definition of the Jacobi symbol as a product of, of the various genre symbols um, over the prime factors of, of B. OK, and then we can look through this file and see if we find something that's relevant for us. So there are um, basic properties. For example, it's multiplicative on the right and on the left. Um, and it's one or minus one if it's not zero and, and things like that. Um, and then at some point, we find this, which says there's a prime. So there's a natural number P, which is a prime that divides N, where the assumption is that this Jacobi symbol that has A on top and N below is minus one. And such that the Jacobi symbol of A and P, which is the general symbol, is minus one, which is at least close to what we want. And so we can just try to use that and see how far we get. So I just copy this. And um, because I can't remember what the precise statement is, I will just, for the time being, say, have well, it equals this. Um, so this gives me an error message, which is maybe a little bit unclear what it means. But um, so what we can do, we can hover on this, and then this window shows us what the definition is. So. I mean, we need to give it this H, which is the statement that some Jacobi symbol is minus one. And so we have such a statement here. This is this HJ. And when we do that, then the error message goes away. So the problem is that there are some implicit arguments here. And if you, so this is the A and the N. And if you don't 
tell this um, theorem what H is, then it cannot figure out what A and N are. And so that it was complaining about this. So we can apply it to HJ and then um, we get a new line in, in this um, tactic state. We have this, this new assumption, which is the statement. I mean, there's a prime P that divides B now and such that the Jacobi symbol of D and P is minus one. And of course we want to, to work with this. And so we have to um, take the statement apart. Yeah? So we want, we want this prime P and um, its properties. And so the, the way of doing this, so there's a tactic. Um, I mean, tactics are these things that allow you to, to build a proof step by step. Um, so this is called obtain. And so we can just um, take this statement, which has sort of four parts. Yeah? The first part is the prime P and then um, its properties was, so the properties were given as a conjunction of three things. And um, with this obtain and then these angle, angle brackets, I can sort of deconstruct the whole thing and get the, the three properties as separate statements. So you see here, if we now have a natural number P and then these three properties, it's a prime, it divides B and the symbol is minus one. Okay. Now, um, what can we do with this? So we know that P divides B B is a factor here, so P will also divide um, the thing on the left, this difference. But D is a non-square mod P, that's, this is what this says. And so um, we know that this is only possible if P divides X and Y, because otherwise we could basically divide by one of them and we could get a square root of D modulo P. So we should look for, for some statement that um, says this, so if we have this symbol that's minus one and P divides the term of the form X squared minus DY squared, then P should divide X and Y. And so we go back to the documentation um, and um, look a bit further. And then here we see something that says that P divides X and P divides Y, so which is pretty much what we want here. So the, the assumption is that the symbol is minus one, P divides this difference, and then it follows that P divides X and P divides Y. So let's take this and do the same. I mean, we get the same kind of error, but um, looking at this, we see that we need to give it um, a proof of the statement that the symbol is minus one. So this is HPJ. Um, okay, now we get a different error message, which says fail to synthesize instance fact not prime P. So that's a kind of technical thing here. Um, if you look at this, then it has this argument in square brackets that says fact that so it's a fact that P is a prime basically. And I mean, the, the square brackets are related to this type class system. So there's a kind of a database of um, things that Lean keeps. And um, if you sort of call something that has an argument like this, Lean tries to find whatever it needs in this database. And the error message says that it failed to do so. So that the fact, this, this explicitly stated fact that P is a prime is not available in this database, but we have a statement that P is a prime here in the context. And so what we can do is um, we can um, we can sort of add this fact to our context so that the next statement can find it. And um, so that's some, some kind of structure here, this fact. And if you don't know, I mean, what you need to provide for this I mean, in order to, to construct this thing, we can just 
and an underscore, and then it appears this blue light bulb here, which gives us possible code actions. And um, the relevant one is the first one, generate a skeleton for the structure under, const under construction. So this will tell us that we need to provide input for, so this is one field that's called out of the structure. And what goes in there is just, <clears throat> just a proof of this fact. And so that's what we call HTTP. Um, and then, I mean, because it's in short, we can just put it on one line. So now um, the error message, the previous error message is gone, but we get another one. I mean, this is the error message that basically says that um, it was not able to work out all the implicit arguments. Um, and so what we also need to give it is this equation. So this is necessary to figure out what um, what X and Y are. And so we just do that, which is, this is H and Q. Um, ah, so I made a mistake here. So it complains that it, this is not the correct type and the mistake is that um, okay, no. Um, sorry, what we need is that P divides this. And so we just have this equality and we still have to, to prove that P divides the left-hand side. So um, let's leave that for now. And first, and then I just comment it out so that we don't get errors here. Um, Prove that P actually divides this this thing. So we have to. So there, there's a slight subtlety here. Um, there's this vertical bar here, which is just just the usual vertical bar on your keyboard. But this vertical bar here is the division, the, uh, the divisibility symbol, and um, that looks very similar, but it's a different Unicode symbol. And so to get it, you have to do something like typing backslash MID as you probably are um, accustomed to from LaTeX. And then, um, oops, you want P to divide this. So here, so previously I just um, have provided immediately the proof of what I wanted to to have, but here I just give the statement and then I have to provide the proof. Okay, now here's another technical point. Um, uh, we get an error on this and it says, um, fail to synthesize instance H sub ZZN, which is um, not so easy to, to understand what it means. Um, so the point is that P is a natural number here. And of course, there's divisibility of natural numbers and there's divisibility of integers and, and more generally. And so if Lean C is a natural number, divides something, then it wants the other thing to also be a natural number. Now, these are integers that are subtracted. And so what this tries to say is, well, I don't know how to subtract two integers and get the natural number out of it. And of course, that's not what we intend here. We don't um, want to say that this, this right-hand side is a natural number. I mean, in general, it can be negative. So what we really want to say is we want to consider this divisibility as a divisibility of integers and not of natural numbers. And so we have to tell Lean that it should consider P not as a natural number, but as an integer. And the way to do that is to um, so write in brackets P colon and then whatever type we want to we want it to be. So in this case we want it to be an integer and then the error is gone. Um and then yeah I mean we are we are left to prove this. Um and yeah maybe just just ask whether there are any questions so far before I go on. I mean I haven't heard anything but as I said, feel free to, to interrupt and ask if you have a question. What is the difference between HPP and HPP prime? 
Um, well, HPP is a proof that P is a prime and HPP prime is sort of the same thing, but wrapped into a structure that's called fact. I mean, mathematically it's the same, but um, if we put it into this fact thing, then it's something that this type class system knows and um, that can be sort of retrieved when we have some statements that require P to be a prime later. So without explicitly giving a proof that P is a prime every time. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we want to prove this divisibility. And of course, the informal argument is that, well, this, this thing on the left is the same as this thing on the right and P divides B, so P divides the product. And so <clears throat> we are done basically, and we want to sort of translate this, this into lean. And so of course the first step is to replace this difference by the right hand side here. And for this, there's the rewrite tactic um, that we can specify some, some equalities and then it will, whenever it finds the left hand side of, of the equality in, in the statement, then it gets replaced by the right hand side. So that's what's happened here. If we, uh, before this, we have this difference and after this is replaced by, by the product on the right hand side. Um, yeah, now there should be some statement that says that if P in this case divides the second factor in the product and, divide, and it divides the product. Um, and so we could try to, to find this in the library. I mean, there's the, all these statements in the library have names and um, the names follow more or less um, a fairly reasonable scheme. So in many cases, you can guess what the name should look like. Should look like. But of course, there are many of them and you don't want to remember. Hmm. So there are some tools one can try to use that sort of search for suitable things in the library. And so the thing that one can use here is called apply question mark. I should say that as of now, it doesn't work perfectly well, but this will change soon. Um, so I mean, this takes a while because it has to do a search and then it suggests various things, um, which in the state it's, it's in right now um, looks a bit scary because there, there's a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary stuff here. Well, essentially, we can just look at the last line here. So that's, um, so it recommends some kind of tactic. So which basically partially applies some statement and then it leaves some, some other goal we have to prove. And so what we want to, to have left here is basically P divides B. So here this is not helpful to place it the right hand side by its absolute value. Um, so this, considers the thing modulo P basically, and then it should be zero. So there are various things that one could do um, and not all of them are necessarily useful here. But here we have something that gets close. So here we have to prove that P divides A, which is not the case, but we can hope that we find something with B also. And that's here. So we can then just click on this suggestion here, try this, blah, blah, blah. And I should warn you that there will be an error message because of this problem. And what we have to do right now is to just remove this strange looking part here and just leave this. So, I mean, there's a fix already in, I think, lean and it will be in MathLib as soon as MathLib gets bumped to the next lean version. Um, Okay, so there, there is, so it came up with this statement, which I mean, looks um, like it may be, may be useful here. So DVD, DVD is, is the division, the divisibility thing. And then my left um, has to do with the product and um, well, whether it's left or right, it's not always so clear, but if you look at it, it says that <clears throat> If you have two elements in the suitable structure, so commutative semigroup, and 
um, the first divides the second and you have a third element, then the first also divides the second if you multiply it on the left by the third one, which is exactly what we need here. And then um, this question mark underscore is the so-called hole. Um, so it leaves something that we have to fill in. Um, and this is the, the proof of, of this divisibility statement here. And the A is what is called C here. Yeah, it's, it's a factor on the left. So now we have to prove that P divides B. And essentially we have this here, but so, I mean, the, the tactic that says, well, this is exactly this is called exact. So if you try this, um, then unfortunately it doesn't work. Yeah, it says that, well, it should, so this is this P divides B, but it should be this. And there are these little up arrows here, which if you, um, should, so maybe I should go before the error message. Um, well, usually it would show what it is, but I mean, I can as well tell you. So this, this up arrow means that um, well, B and P are natural numbers, but here we had we were dealing with divisibility among integers, and so you really consider B and P here as integers, and this up arrow means that well, take this natural number and consider it as an integer. The average is, of course, mathematically there's no difference, but um, to Lean it does make a difference, and so you have to do a little bit more to convince Lean that this. Is basically it's the same as that one, and um, this can be done by replacing exact by exact mod cast. So these these up arrows, the what what they do is called casting, and also modulo casting. This is exactly this HPB. So we have now proved this divisibility, and so we can go back to what we were trying to do. Um, and so, I mean, the thing was that was missing was the statement that P divides this difference, and that's something we have just proved. So we can lock this in here, and um, then what we get is the statement. So the conclusion of this, this lemma, which says that P divides X and P divides Y. And well, I, because I want to use these two statements separately, I can again sort of pull this apart using the obtain technique. And then I have these two statements. So I'm giving them names here, hx and hy. Okay, now, um, now we know that p divides x and p divides y. And then of course, what we want to do is we want to show that p squared divides the left-hand side here and therefore the right-hand side. And then maybe this helps us to move further. So the next thing, um, is to show that p squared divides a times b. Um, yeah, so I'm always running out of names. So I call this capital H. So H is um, very common in this context for hypothesis. And yeah, so the thing I want is that p squared divides a times b, and I will get the same, you know, just say, so sorry, just closes the proof. Um, we have the same problem as before that Dean thinks this is a divisibility of natural numbers. So now it, um, well, the error message is a bit different. So it sees that the right-hand side here is an integer and it tries to um, find something that tells it how to take a power of a natural number to a natural exponent and get an integer out of it. But we can remedy this in the same way as before by declaring that we want to consider P squared as an integer and not as a natural, not as a natural number. Okay, so yeah, the argument is of course, we have this equation HEQ. Um, we want to show that p squared divides the right hand side. So it's the same as showing that p squared divides the left hand side. And this follows from these two things. So 
we again want to replace, but now we want to replace the right-hand side by the left-hand side. And um, so we want to do the rewrite backwards and this can be done um, by using this left arrow. Yeah, and you see that instead of A times B, we now have this difference. Um, and yeah, then of course, I mean, there, there will be statements in the library that tell us that if P squared divides two things and it divides the difference and so on, um, then we can just try to find them using apply again. So let's see if this works. So there are 124 um, suggested things here. And so what we want to see in the end is um, statements that P squared divides X squared and P squared divides D times Y squared. So we scroll a bit and hopefully find something. Okay, so here we have p squared divides x squared, p squared divides z times y squared, and um, the thing is called dvd for divides sub right, so subtraction. Um, not sure where the right comes from because I mean, just takes two things that are divide, divisible by whatever, and then the difference is. Um, so I don't think there's something, oh, here's another one. So maybe that's a little, little bit, well, I don't know if it makes a difference. So it's DVD, DVD sub, which just means that divisibility is compatible with subtraction. So we use this and again, we replace these things just by these holes. Um, and now because we have two of these, we now have two goals. Yeah, one is that p squared divides x squared, and the other one is that p squared divides d times y squared. And then um, it's good to structure the proof by focusing on one goal at a time, which can be done by putting these center dots, which you just get by typing a backslash and a dot. And then you see in after these, we, we only have one goal, first one is p squared divides x squared, and the second one is p squared divides dy squared. Um, and yeah, so now we know that p divides x, then, I mean, obviously it follows that p squared divides x squared, and so there should be something that gives this immediately in the library. Um, I mean, you could try apply, but you can also try exact question mark um, which tries to find an exact proof without any holes in it. And it's very quick and says that this is this. So yeah, the statement says what you expect. So if A divides B and N is a natural number, then A to the N divides B to the N. So for the, for the other one, I mean, we could just try, but um, if, if this, if there's a kind of just one lemma in the library that does it, but as you can see, it takes a while and then it gives up. Um, so it's sort of one step too complicated. So we, we go back to apply. And I mean, it's similar as before. So we, we have a product, we know that P squared divides the right-hand side. And so um, P squared divides the product. So we could just use the same thing as before, but I'm too lazy to do that. Um, so I, but of course, I still have to scroll through all these possibilities to find the right one. Um, P squared divides D is not, but P squared divides Y squared is the one we want. And so we are left with this, and this is basically the same as before. So exact question mark, we find it quickly. And so we are done with the proof of this intermediate fact. So P squared divides this product. Um, 
Yeah, now we know that P divides B. Yeah, that's, that's this, this thing here. Um, and we know that A and B are co-prime. That's this fact that we haven't used so far. And then of course it follows that P squared must divide B because it must be co-prime to A. So, Um, uh, yeah, we should be able to use this. And so this time I don't get an error message if I write this because B is a natural number and P is a natural number. So this is just the visibility of natural numbers. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I want to, to use this and the co-primality of A and B, um, but here, this is a divisibility of integers, and this is a divisibility of natural numbers. So if I want to kind of use general result that says that if something divides a product and is co-prime to the first factor, then it has to divide the second factor. This will give me that P squared divides B as an integer. So um, it's perhaps better to try to prove that. So there's a sort of variant of this have kind of tactic that says, well, it suffices to prove this. So it has a similar effect, but sort of there's a difference in the ordering of the goal. So it suffices to prove that P squared as an integer divides P e as an integer. So here I don't have to, um, So uh, if I put this over here, the, the error message goes away. Um, I don't have to say that B is an integer explicitly because then he knows to, so if, if the left-hand side is an integer and it divides something, then it tries to figure out how to turn the right-hand thing into an integer and it knows how to do that for natural numbers. So I mean, you see the up arrow showing up here again um, without me specifying that it should do that explicitly. So, yeah, so I have to justify that this is sufficient. And so I have to show that assuming this, the statement that I've given here, I can prove what I really want to prove. Um, but this is basically, again, um, similar to what we had before, where we wanted to prove a divisibility of integers and had it for natural numbers. Um, so that's first. Let's just try, try to see if we can do it in the same way and it works. So, I mean, if, if the story is underlined, then this means that we don't need it anymore. That's the arrow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and the effect is that we now have to prove this thing instead where P and B are now considered as integers. And um, we have this and we have the co primality. So, yeah, let's see if we can find, oops, there's one P too many. We can find something in the library that allows us to um, conclude this, assuming co primality. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, but let's see. So if I remember correctly, when I did a kind of dry run of this, um, if at all, then it's very, very far down. Um, but maybe it was not there any, or I mean, too far down to really look at all of this. Yeah, so what we, what we want to see here is um, a goal that we have to show that says that P squared and A are co-prime. So that's, that's the idea. And so um, we try to find something there. There, there's something like is co-prime in the last line. Um, and well, so I'm, I'm getting a bit bored now. So I could try to um, use the documentation page as before, but there's also another possibility and that's called Lugel. 
um, where one can sort of specify parts of a statement, including the arguments, and um, it tells us where we can find this combination of things. So we want something that involves copamality and divisibility, which is spelled in this way. Um, and then we click on find, and then we find a bunch of things which maybe are not. I mean, so the first few say that if something stuff is co-prime and some divisibility, then some other stuff is co-prime. But then we have these things here that are basically what we want, at least one of them. So if X and Y are co-prime and X divides the product, then X divides Z. And this is exactly what we have. We have the P squared divides A times B. We want to conclude that P squared divides B, and we can do this if we know that P squared and A are co-prime. So we take this. Um, um, and then, so what's the first argument? This is the one we want to supply. And the second one is what we know, which is H. The first one is the copramility, the second one is the divisibility. And then we have reduced the goal to showing that P squared and A are coprime. So now let's try apply again. So I mean the idea is that P squared and A are coprime if and only if P and A are coprime, and then P and A are coprime because P divides B and A and B are coprime. So we want some further properties of coprimality, and we hope that maybe apply finds this. And the first one is basically already what we want. Um, so we are reduced to showing that P and A are coprime. Um, and then, okay, I mean, if I now say, say apply, I probably get too many things. Um, because the statement that we want to prove is not very specific, it just says the two things are co-prime and there are lots of ways of showing the two things are co-prime. Um, yeah, for example, by showing that the GCD is one or that the absolute values are co-prime. Um, and there's other things. Uh, so that's something like with the Fermi equation two to four, so four, 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 two which is certainly not useful for us. So maybe it doesn't make much sense to look at, at this long list. And we can go back to, to the search we had before, which um, basically also this, I mean, this this things that have to do with copamility and divisibility. And of course, that's what we want here. So we want to show that P and A are co-prime. We know that A and B are co-prime and that P divides B. So let's see. Um, which version, so that's close, but they have to switch the, let's see. Um, ah, okay, this is the one, so Z is P, Y is B, uh, no, Y is A. <laughs> um, no, sorry. P is B, X is A, so ah, <laughs> which way around? Um, so we know that P divides B, so Y should be B, and um, A and B are co-prime, and P divides B, then A and P are co-prime, so that's almost what we want up to the ordering, so let's try this. So maybe I just um, do it in a similar way as before. So what we have is we have the coprimality, which is H A B, and we have the divisibility, which is well not quite H B P because this is so if I try this I get similar error. Oops, H P B. 
as before, um, because this is divisibility of natural numbers, we want it to be integers. Um, so maybe let's just state this as a divisibility of integers. Oops. With the German keyboard, so the backslash is not so easy to reach. Um, so that's the same thing as before. So up to casting, it's the same as HPB, and then we can put the prime here. And now um, this gives us a proof that A and P are co-prime. And what we want is that P and A are co-prime. So we have to switch the, the ordering and um, this usually can be done by appending a dot sim. And now you see that the order is switched and it's exactly what we want. So we can just say exact. Okay, now what did we do? We have found a prime P that divides B, but we now have shown that not only P divides B, but P squared divides B. And so, yeah, now the idea is um, we can divide the equation by P squared. So we can divide B by P squared and X by P and Y by P. And then we have the same situation again, only that B is smaller. And um, so we want to do basically induction on B. Um, and I mean, uh, not the, the usual induction, they go by one step each time, but the kind of strong induction where you assume that the statement holds for all smaller numbers, and then we, we want to prove it for your given number. And so, um, there's a tactic for this that's called induction or induction prime, which is usually a little bit easier to use. Uh, we want to do induction on B and not the usual induction. So if you just do this, then we get two goals. One says that it holds for zero and one says that if it holds for, for N, then it holds for N plus one. So the successor of N, but that's not useful here. So we can tell it to use a different induction principle and um, that's called strong induction on. Um, and so you see that we just have one goal, which says that if the statement holds for all smaller numbers, then it holds for the number that we consider. Um, and well, here there are some, some strange names. So name for the natural number for which we want to prove the, the statement and the name for the induction hypothesis. And so we want to, to give them um, names that we can use later. So if I say with B and IH, then B will be the name for the natural number, which is, I mean, nice because it's called B here also. And IH is the induction hypothesis which is the statement there. Yeah, so if for all, um, for all smaller numbers, if the conditions are satisfied, then we have a contradiction. And so of course, in the end, you want to apply this with, um, with B divided by P squared. Okay, now, um, yeah, so I guess we are running a little bit short on time. So what we have to do now is um, we have to set up the situation with a smaller b. So let me see. I mean, I have a kind of cheat sheet here. Um, yeah, maybe it would take a little bit long to do that now. But so we have to show a number of things. Um, so, I mean, first thing is you write B as P squared time, times something, I mean, times B divided by P squared. And so it can be done um, 
by, well, let me first do it like this. So the statement that P squared divides um, B, which is H, H prime, divisibility is defined in this form. Yeah, there, there is some, there is some B prime such that B is P squared times B prime, and we can take it apart as before. So we can see through this definition, um, and then maybe we want to replace B prime. Uh, we want to replace B everywhere by by this expression, and there's a little trick that does this if we say Rüffel instead of giving it a name. So that's, that's a special name here. Then it will substitute this P squared times B prime um, in every place where we had B before. So you can see that then that there was um, B before, we now have P squared times B prime. And then we want to, to show that the, the statement in the, I mean, that is, Conditions are satisfied um, for B prime. So we have to prove a number of things. So we need to prove that P prime is less than P squared times B prime, which is our old B. We need to prove that um, A and B prime are co prime. Um, we have we have to show that we have this um, relation, and now we have a problem because these are the same x and y as before, and of course we don't have the relation with the same x and y. So we need to modify this. So we have sort of to to make the induction the statement we prove by induction more general by sort of allowing arbitrary x and y generalizing x, y. Um, and now you see that the, the induction hypothesis has changed. <clears throat> it says that if for all x, y, we have this then, then false. And <clears throat> so we can then um, use this for, I mean, we can replace x by x divided by p and y by y divided by p and um, then prove it for x prime and y prime if, if these are the factors. So we do the same thing basically with the divisibilities we had. So this was hx, I think, and and hy. Um, So now our original equation is down here, looks like this, and then we have to divide both sides by p squared. So we will get something that, well, that maybe um, will be x prime squared minus d times y prime squared equals a times b prime. And then um, you also need to show that the Jacobi symbol of B and B prime is minus one. And I mean, all of these can be done, but take some time. And so finally, assuming we, we did all this, now we can apply the induction hypothesis. So let me write it as refine. Um, I H applied to something. So we need, we want to prime. Um, let's see how many we need. Okay, so the first thing we need is the statement that our M, which is B prime is less than this, which was H1. The second thing we need is um, oh, okay, we need to, so x and y are implicit, and then we need the co primality, which should be h2. Um, and then we need the, the equality, which is h3. And now we have provided enough information that the error message that it cannot find out what these implicit arguments are goes away, and 
The remaining thing is this, which is just H4. And then um, I can replace this by exact because there are no holes in this term anymore. And now this finishes the proof and also the hour. So it took a little bit longer than I expected. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it nevertheless.